Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome Balu Sivan uh, to a uh, talk on near optimal online algorithms and fast approximation algorithms. So Balu is uh, a PhD student at uh, University, of, University of Wisconsin Madison. He was uh, an intern here last year, and uh, uh, most of the work uh, that he's going to present was done while he was an intern. And uh, he's back for a couple of weeks. Uh, so and he'll tell us about. Uh, this work. Thank you. Um, so I'll be talking about some recent giant work with uh, Nikhil, Kamal, and Chris Wilkins. So Chris was an intern here last year too. And this is going to be on near optimal online algorithms and uh, fast approximation algorithms. So uh, the focus of this work is really twofold. Uh, part one of this work is going to be on stochastic analysis of online algorithms, by which I mean online algorithms whose input satisfies some stochastic property. That is, uh, the, input, the elements of input could be drawn from some IAT distribution, or the elements of the input could be drawn from, I mean, could be picked by some adversary, but they come in some random arrival, or some such stochastic property. That's what I mean there. And we do this analysis for a fairly general class of problems called the resource allocation problems, which I'll describe minute. Uh, this is the first part. The second part is uh, fast approximation algorithms for uh, large mixed packing and covering LPs. It's LPs which have both packing and covering constraints. Okay. So I'll describe all these. Uh, so moving on to part one, this area of uh, online algorithms with stochastic input has recently received a lot of revived interest. So this is partly motivated by uh, its applications to online advertising. Almost all problems in online advertising squarely fit in this framework of online algorithms, stochastic input. And uh, the trend really has been in all these areas to go beyond uh, worst case analysis. And this is because worst case analysis, we have pessimistic bounds that you cannot go beyond constant factor approximations in many of these problems. And we are not happy with that. We would want something like 99% approximation, not things like 60% approximation. And the idea is to see if we can get those 99% approximations in a uh, stochastic setting. So by stochastic, as I said, people assume that the input comes from some random permutation or it's drawn from some distribution. The distribution could be known to the uh, designer or unknown to the algorithm designer and all those variants. Okay. So uh, to make things concrete, I'm going to fix a representative problem. This is the uh, now famous uh, AdWords problem. So it's basically uh, you have a bipartite graph. One side is advertisers. The other side is queries. These queries are arriving online. And uh, these advertisers have specified bids on these queries. So bij is the bid of advertiser i on query j. And as soon as a query arrives, uh, the algorithm designer or the search engine here has to uh, assign this query to one of the advertisers or drop it if he wills. Uh, he has to, I mean, the goal is for the search engine to maximize its own revenue subject to budget constraints. So each advertiser has specified a daily budget or some unit of time, budget for some unit of time. And that is the first constraint in the LP. You respect the budget constraints. And of course, no keyword can be given to more than one advertiser. And that's what the LP says. You maximize this revenue. This is the AdWords problem. I'm going to use this for presenting your results to the results applied to a more general class of problems. Uh, here, M is the number of keywords, the queries, and N is the number of advertisers. Okay. So first step is uh, what's known about the AdWords problem. Um, all the results for the AdWords problem are going to be specified in terms of one parameter. So this is basically the largest bid to budget ratio. So you take all the bids for a particular advertiser and then divide it by the budget. This is the bid to budget ratio for that advertiser. You do this for all the advertisers and take the maximum and call this gamma. Okay. Now, uh, the first result in this for the AdWords problem was by Mehta, Saberi, Wazirani, and Wazirani in 2005. And uh, they were the ones to really coin this problem. So they give a 1 minus 1 by E approximation for the adverse problem in the worst case setting, meaning that it, the adversary picks the set of keywords. It also picks the order in which the keywords arrive. Okay. And for this worst case setting, they give a 1 minus 1 by E approximation. And they also prove that uh, you cannot do beyond 1 minus 1 by E in this worst case. Even a randomized algorithm cannot do anything beyond 1 minus 1 by E. 
but uh, their results require that uh, this parameter gamma goes to zero. What that means is the bids are insignificantly small compared to budgets. So uh, the first paper to really show that uh, a big improvement is possible in a stochastic setting was a paper two years ago by uh, Nikhil and uh, Tom Hayes at EC. Uh, so what they solved was the same problem, but with the assumption that the uh, keywords are arriving in a random order, not in adversarial order. Once you assume this, you get a one minus epsilon approximation for any epsilon. Uh, but again, there's a restriction. The assumption here is that that parameter gamma, which I said, is depending on epsilon. It's uh, some epsilon cubed by n log m and some function of epsilon and nm. Um, so that's good. I mean, this is what we wanted in a stochastic setting. But uh, from then on, from once this paper came, there have been a lot of extensions of uh, applying the same result to different kinds of problems or improving this parameter gamma. So but typically, we want gamma to be as big as 1. We don't want to restrict it. It could be anything between 0 and 1. So you don't want to put a restriction saying it's going to be very small. The goal is to make gamma as big as possible. And the best improvement so far has been uh, a paper by Agarwal, Wang, and A, uh, where uh, they use the same idea in this, except that they use a technique called doubling and uh, cut off one factor of epsilon here. It becomes epsilon squared. And what they show is that uh, they also show an upper bound of epsilon squared by log n. I mean, that you cannot take gamma to as big as 1. There's a restriction. If you want a 1 minus epsilon approximation, gamma is going to depend on uh, epsilon quadratically like this. But this lower bound is for a slightly general uh, version of the problem called resource allocation problem, which I'll describe. Anyway, so this is the uh, status of adverse problem. So uh, the first result in this paper is a threefold improvement of uh, current status in this problem. So uh, in our model, we're going to assume that the inputs are drawn from some IAD distribution but it is unknown to the algorithm designer. Okay. And in this model, uh, firstly, we give the same 1 minus epsilon approximation with almost the best dependence on gamma possible. So our bit to budget ratio gamma is epsilon squared by log n by epsilon. And uh, we, uh, I mean, the results here uh, not only work for just IAD distributions, but the adversary is allowed to vary the distribution every time. So the distribution is going to be time varying even for such a model, uh, our results hold. So we introduced this model for stochastic analysis called the adversarial stochastic input model. I'll describe what that model is. It basically allows the adversary to pick distributions which vary over time, but that the distributions are not too terrible. As long as that holds, uh, our algorithm still works. I'll make these things formal in a minute. And uh, these results, as I said, are uh, going to be applicable to a fairly more general class of problems called resource allocation problems. So uh, I'll now move on to uh, define what the resource allocation framework is. Is it clear that the IID is actually easier than a permutation formally? Yeah, for adverse problem, yes, IID is easier than uh, random permutation. That is, if you solve random permutation, then there is a way to solve IID. So once you fix the number of keywords for uh, uh, in any given category, then it's just a random permutation in that category. So you can consider random permutations in many different categories. If you can solve random permutation, you can solve each of these categories well. Can the distribution over yes, it is a distribution. But it's true that IAD is somewhat weaker than random permutation, but it's not. This is this adversarial stochastic input where the distribution can vary over time. That is incomparable to random permutations. So I'll, I'll describe. Uh, how the distributions can vary over time. OK, so I'll first describe what the resource allocation framework is. So it's the same um, kind of online flavor uh, where now requests are arriving online. And uh, you want to serve these requests. There are a bunch of options to serve any given request. And once you pick an option to serve a request, this request option pair is going to consume some amount of every resource available. So there are n resources available, and m requests are arriving online. Once you pick an option k, this request option pair jk is going to give you a profit wjk, and it's also going to consume aijk amount of resource i. Okay. Um, the same thing, you cannot uh, serve a request with more than one option. That is what the second constraint says. And uh, the goal is to maximize your profit subject to capacity constraints, because each resource has a capacity. ci is the capacity of resource i. Um, so k is the number of options, and this could be exponential. 
So to uh, just to have a concrete example in mind, I'm going to describe network routing uh, as a resource allocation problem. So think of uh, you as algorithm designer having some graph, and requests are basically uh, requests to route from a source to a sink in a graph. And uh, you should the options are basically the exponentially many paths available for you to choose. You could choose one of these paths. And uh, the resources are the edges, and these edges have capacities. And of course, depending on which option, which path you choose, different edges are going to get consumed. So this squarely fits with the previous framework. Um, so for this problem, the previous best result uh, was uh, epsilon squared by n log mk by epsilon. So k, as I said, is a number of options. And for a graph, you have exponentially many paths. It could be like 2 to the n. So this is really like epsilon squared by n squared. So ours is epsilon squared by log n by epsilon. It's like a quadratic improvement. But the difference is that this holds for random permutations, and our result is for IAD with unknown distributions or the time varying distribution model. OK. So I'll now describe this uh, time varying model. So here, uh, the algorithm designer is given some target, op t. So this is the benchmark against which the competitive ratio is going to get defined. And now the goal of the algorithm designer is to get as best an approximation as possible to this op t. And adversary is going to pick time varying distributions, except that what we ask is for every distribution that the adversary picks, the expected value of the optimal solution on that distribution. Meaning that if that distribution were to be used throughout, find the optimal value uh, an algorithm can get, take the expectation. That should be at least the target given to you. So this is like the minimum one could ask for. At least the optimal algorithm should, in expectation, uh, do as well as the target. If that is true, then however skewed the distributions may be, as long as the expectation is true, uh, our, all our algorithms work and our 1 minus epsilon results hold. Okay. So that is the uh, adversary stochastic input model. So just to recall, in this adversary stochastic input model, uh, for the resource allocation framework, we have this 1 minus epsilon with the best dependence on bit to budget ratio possible. Um, so I'm now going to move on to the second result in this paper. Uh, so, so far, uh, I've been talking about problems where the bit to budget ratio or gamma was really small. That is, it depended uh, quadratically on epsilon for a 1 minus epsilon approximation. The question is, what happens when gamma is as big as 1, meaning that bids are comparable to budgets? So this problem has remained largely open. I mean, since the problem was kind, uh, the best competitive ratio known, even in stochastic settings, not in worst case, even in stochastic, the best ratio known was uh, half. And this comes through a very trivial uh, greedy algorithm, and nothing better was known. Um, but special cases of this problem have seen a lot of progress uh, recently. So the online bipartite matching is a special case of this problem. So, so in this is, is an oversimplified special case, meaning that all the bids are same, all the budgets are same. It's just the matching problem. And for this problem, uh, two years ago, uh, Feldman, uh, Mehta, Mirokne, and Muthukrishnan uh, gave an algorithm which uh, beats 1 minus 1 by E, uh, but for known distributions. The right hand side of the graph is being, basically being drawn from some distribution which is known to the algorithm designer. And they beat 1 minus 1 by E. And after that, there were a series of results by Bamanis and Caprolo, and the best is by uh, Manshadi, Gayan, and, uh, Garan, and Saberi, which uh, give a 0.702 for this problem. And recently, in this talk, uh, Madhyan and Yan and uh, Karande, Mehta and Tripathi analyzed the same online bipartite matching problem, but in a random permutation setting. That is, uh, you could think of it as IAD but unknown distributions or something more powerful than that. In that setting, they give a 0.696 approximation. And, uh, that's the current best mode. But of course, for this work, I'm going to focus on the more general uh, problem of uh, adverts in the unbounded gamma setting, but in the stochastic setting. So the second result is that uh, in the IAD unknown distributions, or even better in the adversarial stochastic input model, the simple greedy algorithm uh, gets a 1 minus 1 by E approximation against the expected optimal fractional solution. Okay. So uh, the greedy algorithm is uh, really simple in the sense that when a query arrives, you're going to assign it to the advertiser who has the maximum effective bid uh, for that query. Effective bid is basically the minimum of the bid and the remaining budget for that advertiser. It's effectively what he can contribute at that point. You contribute it, uh, you com compute it for all the advertisers and choose the advertiser who has the maximum effective bit. This gives 1 minus 1 by E. Uh, so previously, the same greedy algorithm has been analyzed by Goel and Mehta in 2008. 
and uh, they analyze it for the same uh, adverse problem in the random arrival model. They also get a 1 minus 1 by E, except that uh, they make an assumption on bids and budgets, which almost boils down to saying that gamma goes to 0. Right. Um, but here we have uh, unbounded gamma. Okay. So, yes, that is the second result. Um, the third problem, third result in this paper is, uh, now I'm going to move on to offline instances. So uh, last year at EC, Charles, Nikhil, Kamal, and others had a paper uh, which gives a sampling-based algorithm. It's a randomized algorithm uh, for problems like matchings on huge graphs. So these graphs are so huge that uh, no classical algorithm is useful. You want an algorithm which has a simple sweep, a single sweep through the graph. Um, so what we do in this paper is uh, generalize these kind of algorithms for uh, more general problems. We solve, basically, we have this mixed packing and covering LPs, and uh, we solve mixed packing and covering LPs. Uh, we approximate it uh, with, I mean, uh, with pretty fast approximation algorithms. So uh, here is the precise problem. You have these, uh, a bunch of packing constraints there, the first set of constraints, and uh, a bunch of covering constraints, the greater than or equal to inequalities. And you have a polytope constraint. Uh, this is the polytope, this is a unit simplex polytope constraint. And uh, the goal is basically to find out whether this set of constraints has a feasible solution or not. So we distinguish between this yes and no case. Yes is there is a feasible solution. No is even if I slightly relax this right hand side, basically I multiply by 1 plus epsilon or 1 minus epsilon, depending on the sign of the inequality. Even with the relaxation, uh, this LP doesn't have any feasible solution. Can you distinguish between these two cases with a very high probability, like 1 minus delta or 1 minus epsilon, for example? Uh, that's what we saw as a second result. Uh, so uh, before stating the result, here is some notation. So uh, let pj be the unit simplex, basically. We assume that there is some oracle which does the following job for us. If I give a vector, then uh, the oracle should return uh, some vector xj from the polytope that minimizes v dot xj. So this, is, this might look strange, but it's not really strange. For example, in the network routing problem, what this translates to is, if I give you a vector of exponentially many paths, you choose me the shortest path and give me. That's what this is. I mean, we know that shortest path is easy in polynomial time. And in, for many problems, I mean, you have natural oracles. Anyway, if you have these oracles, we say that uh, you can solve this gap version of the mixed packing covering, the yes or no with a high probability, with so many oracle calls, gamma m by epsilon squared, some log oracle calls, okay? So that is the third result for offline instances. So, of course, while talking about mixed packing covering LPs, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a long line of previous work on this. So, uh, Young uh, in 95 and Plotkin, uh, Shimois and Tardash in 91, I mean, they, they solved a fairly very general class of mixed packing and covering LPs. Uh, but the thing is, uh, they require gamma squared, m squared by epsilon squared, and some log oracle calls. Uh, what we say is that, I mean, that is for a very general class of LPs. Now, what we say is that if you add the special polytope, uh, namely the unit simplex constraint, which is very natural because all the resource allocation problems fall squarely with the polytope constraint, that some more kxj case less than one. Don't give a request to more than one option. Then you can cut down on the gamma square m squared by uh, two gamma m. So the quadratic becomes linear. Um, so that's the comparison to previous work on this. So uh, I presented previous results. The common idea really behind uh, all these results is the following two-stage approach. The first stage is to uh, develop, uh, uh, I mean, algorithm which is omniscient or a knowledgeable algorithm. This algorithm has uh, knowledge of the distribution, and, and based on the distribution, it could have knowledge of the optimal solution for the offline instance. So uh, by offline instance, I mean you construct an expected instance of the problem. Each request arrives expected number of times, and uh, that is an offline instance. Right? You compute, once you know the distribution, you can compute the expectation. You have this offline instance. Suppose you solve this optimally, and suppose even that is known to this knowledgeable algorithm, then uh, you can use that knowledgeable algorithm to uh, achieve the required competitive ratio, describe how. And then uh, the analysis of this algorithm should satisfy some properties. And once it does, you can uh, remove this uh, uh, dependence of knowledge. You can give a knowledge oblivious, a distribution oblivious algorithm, which achieves the same competitive ratio. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, I'm now going to describe uh, step one, and this is uh, best illustrated through a toy problem. Uh, so in this toy problem, what's happening is some items are arriving online, and uh, each item has a cost, item I S cost CI. And uh, you can do two things when an item arrives. You can either put the item in a bag. This bag has capacity G. There are, uh, only G items can go inside the bag. Or you pay the cost for the item, and then you don't put that item in the bag if you pay for it. Um, the goal is to minimize the total cost you pay, so respecting this capacity constraint of the bag. And these items are drawn from some distribution. Okay, these costs are drawn from some distribution, which is uh, unknown to the algorithm designer. And as I said, minimize the total cost. Uh, I'm going to assume for simplicity that the optimal cost somehow turns out to be that optimal cost is equal to the total capacity G. Okay. It doesn't matter, but I use this for simplicity. Uh, well, the first step is, uh, suppose we knew the distribution from which these costs arrive, then what can we do? Then we can do a very simple algorithm. You can uh, set some threshold alpha then say that if the cost is more than alpha, uh, then I'm going to put the item in the bag. It's too much for me to pay. If the cost is less than alpha, then I pay for it. Okay. And you choose this threshold alpha so that the probability P, uh, that this cost is more than alpha, is such that uh, the expected number of items uh, more, uh, for which you're going to pay, which are going into the bag, MP is equal to G. The bag doesn't spill. Now, uh, you calculate this threshold and you do this in the on for the online algorithm and you can prove that this online algorithm does very well. And that's what I'm going to analyze now. I'm going to use that analysis to drop knowledge of the distribution. So some simple notation before proceeding. Uh, XT, I'm going to say that at stage T, whether you put the item into the bag or not. If you put it into the bag, it's one. If it's zero, otherwise. And YT, similarly, uh, how much cost you paid. If you paid for item i at step t, yt is ci. If you didn't pay for any item, yt is zero. Okay. Now, uh, just note that the expected value of xt uh, is exactly p. It's just g by m, according to construction. Similarly, the expected value of yt, uh, in total, you're going to the opt is equal to g. So for one step, opt is opt by, I mean, the value is opt by m, which is g by m. So these two quantities have the same expectation. What's the difference between i and t? Uh, so i is items used to index the items. t is the step t. The algorithm proceeds in steps. So uh, uh, yeah, so i is used to index items. You could think of n items. And t is the algorithm proceeding in steps. Probably you can, uh, I mean, the same item can arrive many times, basically, while drawing for the distribution. So. Uh, I'm going to ask you, I mean, this is some more bit of more notation. So VT is the uh, sum over all YI still step T. And ST is the sum over all XI still step T, right? And the goal is to uh, ask what are these quantities. So after M steps, what is the probability that the uh, total size you have accumulated in the bag is more than G times 1 plus epsilon? That is, what is the probability that you're spilling over capacity? You could ask the same thing for cost. What is the probability that you paid more than opt times 1 plus epsilon, opt is g here. This is the probability of a suboptimal cost, paying more than what is necessary. And if these two probabilities are small, then we are approximately good. Right? Uh, so the standard way to analyze uh, this is uh, the following. So you take this probability and uh, you exponentiate both sides. Okay? You raise it by the power of 1 plus epsilon. And you apply Markov's inequality in that step. and uh, this step, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, saying that SM is the sum over all XIs. Um, so this step is based on convexity, that the exponential function is convex. So I can bring the exponent as a, as a product here, basically. Um, now I'm conditioning. So this probability is basically conditioned on what has happened in the first T steps. So X1 to XT are no more random variables. The remaining things are random variables, and then I take an expectation for xi. I told you that the expectation for xi is just uh, g by m, so it's epsilon times g by m. So this is basically an upper bound on the conditional failure probability of the algorithm, that the failure probability that you're going to overspill. You can compute the same quantity for opt. It's not interesting. This is the same failure upper bound on the conditional failure probability. Okay. 
So uh, I've now returned the sum over these two failure probabilities, that the union bound of these two failure probabilities. The point is, uh, all these terms are common, so we can drop them off. So we get a simple scaled version of the conditional failure probability. So you can just analyze this, what happens to this. Um, so uh, I've written the same thing here. The failure probability of t steps is uh, upper bounded by the sum over those two quantities. That's a scaled version. The question really is to ask what happens to this quantity as the algorithm proceeds right? in, in expectation or one step, namely the t plus oneth step. What happens to this quantity? So uh, what happens basically, I mean this fpx is going to get multiplied by one more one plus epsilon xi. And this is going to get multiplied by one more one plus epsilon yi. Uh, but both these are the same expectation. So you have the same old quantity multiplied by some constant. That's what has happened in one step. And this is, this is what is the proof, uh, basically this is the main ingredient in the proof for the knowledge aware algorithm that the failure probability actually didn't increase by more than a constant in every step and I actually scaled things for you. That's why you see an increase there. If we didn't scale it, there was really no increase. And uh, if you just proceed through n steps, this algorithm gets a very good approximation. The failure probability is very small. If only we can ensure that uh, the algorithm which did not know the distribution also had the same property, that the failure probability did not increase by more than a constant factor, that would be great. And that's really what we are going to do. Uh, question is, did we require knowledge of distribution to ensure what I just said the last step? Um, basically, you could have explicitly minimized this upper bound on failure probability. So you have a pessimistic estimate of the failure probability, which is the upper bound. Why don't you explicitly minimize that? By which I mean, you have two options, put the item in the bag or cost. If you put it into the bag, then the failure probability after t plus one steps is uh, just this quantity gets disturbed. It gets multiplied by one plus epsilon. The other thing remains the same because y is zero. Or you put the item, you pay the cost for the item, then this doesn't get disturbed. And there you get a one plus epsilon ct plus one. You decide based on which of those is uh, smaller, the one, the quantity in the red rectangle. And uh, basically what this says is that you choose that option x or y based on which of these two is minimal, fpx or cost times fpy. So this means uh, basically, uh, I'm just dividing by uh, the product of uh, one plus epsilon y's. So we are setting a threshold on cost here. Without knowing the distribution, you can do this. This is the same thing as the original algorithm, the same kind of threshold, except that we have a time varying threshold now. It's a simple algorithm and easy to update the threshold, a multiplicative update of the threshold. And uh, without knowing the distribution, you can do the same thing as the original algorithm. Okay. Um, so to recap, I mean, this was a two-step process. We first developed an algorithm which knew the distribution, and then we dropped this uh, uh, dependency on distribution or the optimal solution. And uh, I just want to point out what were the necessary steps to uh, develop these kind of algorithms. One is that the algorithm proceeds in steps. And uh, if the performance of the algorithm is measured by some random variable, call it Q, then the proof should basically lie uh, uh, in the fact that a pessimistic estimate of Q or an upper bound of Q uh, did not increase by too much in any step. These are the requisite properties of uh, your hypothetical algorithm. And once this is satisfied, you need a fourth thing, which is the quality of the pessimistic estimate you choose. If you are clever enough in choosing your pessimistic estimate so that it minimizing it doesn't require knowledge of distribution. That's what we did. We minimized an upper bound on the failure probability. That did not require knowledge of distribution. Then uh, you're done, basically. You can remove knowledge of distribution. And whenever you see a potential function-based argument, this is really what is going on in all these arguments. So phi t, a potential function of step t, is basically a pessimistic estimate of q conditioned on the first t steps. And people generally argue that uh, in step t plus one in expectation, the potential function didn't increase. And they also argue that the potential function, minimizing the potential function, does not require knowledge of the distribution. Therefore, an algorithm can come and do this and, uh, without knowledge of distribution. It's done. So uh, this approach is quite general, as you can see. I mean, for this problem, the metric Q, which we used to measure, was the failure probability. And for a future algorithm, for the adverse problem with the unbounded gamma, this same metric is going to be uh, unspent budget. Same analysis, you just substitute for Q. Instead of the failure probability, you substitute uh, unspent budget. The analysis goes through. 
And the source of knowledge itself can be quite general. I mean, first, previously, this was used for uh, de-randomizing randomized uh, algorithms. Uh, but you can use it for uh, online algorithms as stochastic input, as I said. Uh, you can make the algorithm distribution oblivious. And of course, offline or online, you can use for both. Um, so that's it for the proof of uh, uh, the resource allocation problem. I'm now going to discuss a uh, bunch of special cases which fall into the resource allocation framework. So just to remind you of the framework, that there are requests and resources and some capacities for resources, and there are options. Okay, this is the framework. So the first special case is uh, combinatorial auctions. So uh, here you have uh, n items for sale, and there are uh, CI copies of uh, each item, and buyers are uh, arriving online, and uh, these buyers have utilities over subsets of items. So since there are n items, there are two to the n subsets. You have utility over all these two to the n subsets. And the goal is to do the following. You post some prices on these items, and when the buyers arrive online, they are going to pick their favorite bundle, uh, that is their utility maximizing bundle based on these prices. And uh, can you approximate the social welfare subject to capacity constraints. Social welfare means the sum total of utility obtained by all the buyers. Can you get a good approximation to social welfare through simple posted prices? Is the question. So we make two assumptions here. The first assumption is that if we post prices, that uh, buyers must be able to pick their utility maximizing bundle. So the, there are exponentially many bundles, so you could ask why, but uh, that's the minimum you, could, uh, you should assume for solving a problem like this. If you post prices, buyers must be able to pick their favorite bundle. Uh, and we also assume that bidders, once they leave the mechanism, they are going to reveal their utility function. That is after purchase, not before purchase. Um, so the mapping uh, to resource allocation is uh, fairly straightforward. So the uh, items here correspond to uh, the resources the requests here correspond to the buyers, and the options here correspond to the exponentially many bundles available. And the gamma, which, is, which was there, the bid-to-budget ratio, uh, here can be thought of as the resource consumption to the capacity, or uh, one, you, whenever you buy a bundle, you have one of every item. The capacity is basically number of copies. The minimum of that is min over ICI. And incentive constraints aside, by that I mean, suppose these bidders were to act however the algorithm tells them to act. They are not interested in maximizing their utility for a moment if you assume that. Then you can just apply the previous resource allocation uh, algorithm here. You can get a 1 minus epsilon approximation to the social welfare, so it's good, uh, with this assumption that the gamma satisfies something, which means that the minimum number of copies of any item is at least so much. And you can do this. But of course, I mean, bidders have uh, incentive constraints. They are not going to act as we tell them. So the question is uh, whether the old algorithm respects the incentives of bidders. So I didn't present the algorithm for the general problem. I only presented it for the toy problem because it looks complicated to write down. But it's the, the algorithm at step k chooses an option to minimize this, this expression. But you can factor terms out, and it basically looks something like this, where the term pi uh, is uh, I've pulled out uh, the multiplicative factor there, the denominator. So the term PI is this. So what this term looks like is it looks like utility for a buyer, right? It looks like utility minus the sum over uh, the prices I pay for the bundle. So if only I'm able to post these prices PI for item, the buyer is going to do precisely what I wanted to do as an algorithm. The algorithm is going to pick the option K to maximize that. The buyer will do exactly that if he posts these prices. Okay. So that solves the combinatorial auction problem with incentives. And I want to point out that uh, I mean this request, uh, this uh, requirement that bidders reveal their utility after leaving actually can be relaxed if only you assume that uh, there is some target given to you that the social welfare like op, uh, W star is given to you. You are asked to approximate W star. Then there is no need for bidders to reveal their utility function, and uh, the prices actually remain the same for all the buyers. Nothing gets updated. You post these prices and you're done. Um, Case for, uh, for this is for a stochastic case. The bidders are drawn from some distribution. Okay, the prices have to change, right? No, if we know the uh, utility. The prices system is uh, CIX. Oh, okay. So yeah, so the prices are going to get updated over time. Yeah. 
So we don't require, uh, okay, so we don't require buyers to reveal their utility, but the prices get updated over time, yes. Um, so there are many other uh, special cases. One is the uh, display ad allocation. So in this problem, basically, advertisers are, uh, I mean, this is the advertisers getting their advertisements in web pages. And basically how this works is they come to web pages and ask, sign a contract saying that uh, in this month we require one million impressions to be shown. And uh, these web pages maximize their revenue uh, respecting these uh, contracts that they've already signed. And uh, we will maximize your revenue respecting these contracts. And this fits squarely into the resource allocation framework. And network routing I already discussed and uh, load balancing. And the other application is many algorithms actually uh, uh, require a training phase uh, when they are dealing with distributions. They, they train their algorithm for a few samples, and then based on this training, the algorithm performs for the remaining samples. But uh, if we use our algorithm with some given target W star to achieve, you don't need to train at all. It straight away works. So for all those algorithms, this can be used as a replacement, and we point out some instances in the paper. Um, so then the natural question is, what if W star is unknown? Uh, the, the potential function basically depended on W star. What if it was not known? If it's not known, you periodically uh, get uh, increasingly better estimates of W star as the algorithm runs. So uh, the initial estimates of W star are going to be very bad because you have a few samples, but it increasingly gets better. To offset the fact that the initial estimates are uh, erroneous, these uh, phases of the algorithm are going to be such that they are exponentially increasing. So the later phases have a much better, more effect on the uh, quality of the output than the initial phases. So the inaccuracy is basically offset by this. And you can get the same performance as before, even without knowledge of W star. Do you mean one minus, one minus epsilon or constant? One minus epsilon. Uh, without knowledge of W star. The fact that you lost during the way, you don't lose a constant here. We don't lose a constant because there is an exponentially increasing size of phases. So it's the initial phase is uh, uh, k, then it becomes uh, twice that, then it becomes twice that, and so on. Um, so this also, I mean, there is an improvement here over the previous algorithm. The previous algorithm actually periodically required computing the entire solution. And we only require estimation of the W star, the optimal value. Meaning that if somebody were to give us this W star, then we are done. There is really no estimation required. Um, okay, so that is for the first problem. So now this is the second problem with unbounded gamma, that the bit to budget ratio is, I mean, the bit could be as big as budget. For this problem, as I said, the algorithm really is the same. This is a two step process of developing a knowledge aware algorithm and dropping knowledge of distribution, except that the potential function is now the unspent budget, right? Now you want to consume as much of uh, budget as possible from every advertiser, which means your goal is to minimize the unspent budget of every advertiser. And you can prove that this uh, hypothetical knowledge aware algorithm uh, 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 brings down the unspent budget by a factor of one minus one by M in every round. And like the previous algorithm, our goal is to choose that algorithm which explicitly minimizes the unspent budget over any given step. And that is the greedy algorithm because the greedy algorithm is going to consume the maximum amount in a particular step. And by the previous proof, the greedy algorithm should do the same thing, that it also brings down the unspent budget by a factor of one minus one by M even round. And uh, this basically gives a one minus one by E approximation. So one minus one by M times M is one by E. So you get a one minus one by E approximation. Um, so uh, I'll briefly mention what we do for the offline problem, the mixed packing covering problem. So we basically uh, solve this offline problem as if it was an online instance. So what we do is we are going to sample these requests. So we are going to sample the right-hand side of the LP. And uh, sampling and dealing with them is like as if there were things coming online. Now it becomes just like the online problem. And uh, you can minimize the pessimistic estimate of the failure probability at each step and you only require gamma m by epsilon square oracle calls. In particular, it's an improvement over the uh, previous quadratic dependence on uh, oracle calls because of the fact that we assumed there was a unit simplex polytope requirement. So uh, I'll mention only that much for uh, mixed packing covering. You assume unit simplex uh, 
for one variable, for, for the whole variables? I mean, is it only one additional constraint or it's many? No, it's for all. I mean, for every uh, request, uh, we assume that you can give it to at most one option. So for all j, sum over k x j k is at most one. It's many simple. Yeah, in many simple, yes. That's right. Um, so uh, I'll summarize and uh, present some open problems. So uh, basically, we solve this uh, resource allocation problem in the small, uh, small resource consumption setting with the optimal dependence possible on gamma. We have one minus epsilon approximation in the unknown distribution model. And uh, we, gave, we, we improved the factor for the unbounded gamma setting from half to 1 minus 1 by e through a simple greedy algorithm. The, for the greedy algorithm itself, this analysis is tight, that you cannot go beyond 1 minus 1 by e, but uh, it's, it's not clear that this is the best you can do. I, mean, I believe that there's an improvement possible. And uh, we solve approximation algorithm, we give approximation algorithms for mixed packing and covering. And uh, I mean, all those previous results applied not just to IAD, but for the new model which we introduced in this paper, maybe the adversarial stochastic input model where distributions change over time, but any given distribution is not terrible. Okay. Um, the open problems, the most interesting open problems are twofold. One is, in general, uh, any results, uh, any result which held for uh, unknown distribution model uh, actually also holds for the random permutation model also. But for our problem, we were not able to prove that it holds for random permutations. I mean, we don't have counterexamples either. I definitely believe that these algorithms hold good for the random permutation, but we don't know how to prove. So it would be good to prove uh, or surprising if there's a counterexample. Uh, the second question is the following. Um, for the worst case setting for the adverse problem, I initially said that there is a 1 minus 1 by E approximation, which cannot be improved. And for the stochastic setting, there are various 1 minus epsilon approximation algorithms. But these are two different algorithms, really. Uh, what I want is a single algorithm which simultaneously gets a 1 minus 1 by E approximation and a 1 minus epsilon approximation. That would be really good. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, recently there seems to be uh, some progress towards this question that for the most general problem, you cannot uh, achieve these two simultaneously, but uh, probably you could do it for simpler settings. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Any questions? So, just to clarify, that uh, improvement over I mean, uh, adding this synthesis constraints. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is it? Is it different significantly than, than Young algorithm? No, the thing is, Young for mixed packing covering had to use uh, uh, additive Chernoff bounds, mm -hmm. and uh, additive Chernoff bounds are weaker than multiplicative Chernoff bounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason for using additive Chernoff bounds was, I mean, uh, having arbitrary polytopes. If only we have this uh, multiplicative. Uh, if this unit simplex, you can uh, you you can use multiplicative Chernoff bounds. That's the main difference. It's the same multiplicative update kind of algorithm, but the uh, potential function is different. We use it based on uh, multiplicative Chernoff bounds. That that gives us. So, just replacing that one by some other constant. Uh, that goes to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you cannot have an arbitrary quality. Yeah. Everything is positive. Yeah, yes. So actually, if you had equal to, then we don't know. Yeah, if you have equal to, it's a problem, yes. If you have equal to, the, you can't use multiplicative Chernoff bounds. You have to go to additive Chernoff bounds. Basically, I think the equal to step uh, almost covers all the other I mean, the most difficult case. If only you can solve equal to, you can basically solve other, all other polytopes. What do you mean? You can put a large, small or equal, large or equal at the same time? No, no, but uh, the assumption is that CI and DIs are all large, right? Compared to DIs. So those are the, yeah. the easy constraints. Mm -hmm. In the, in the sense that uh, those constraints, the AIJKs are all small compared to CIs. Yeah. And BIJKs are small compared to DIs. So 
those are the easy constraints. These are the hard constraints which you have to solve in every step. Mm -hmm. So we, these hard constraints, if they look like this, then we can get this uh, gamma and factor. But if this hard constraint is arbitrary, for instance, if this hard constraint is say, it's equal to, then we need this. That's what uh, PST and M gives us So we use some special structure because the duals turn out to be positive. So we can just use multiplicative duals of a certain. Value. That's right. Basically, the dual variable for this will be positive. And if it was equal to, then the dual will not be of any sign. So you can't apply multiplicative Chernoff bounds on the duals. That's what. So it's like uh, all of us.